Hello, my name is Alex Isles, and in this episode, we're going to be looking at four of the deities on Hadrian's Wall. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at four deities in the Roman pantheon, and alongside this as well, their representation up here on Hadrian's Wall. Just behind me right here, I've got a depiction of Segedunum Roman Fort, at which is today's Wall's End in North Tyneside, just at the end of well, what it was, would have been the start of Hadrian's Wall when it was constructed, but is now known as Wall's End. You can just see the wall here going into the River Tyne, and then a temple that is um, speculated to have been dedicated to Emperor Hadrian just there at the end of the river. But the gods we're going to look at today are Mercury, Neptune, Oceanus and Hercules and we're going to be talking about each of those gods in detail and then alongside this as well looking at some of their representations up here on the northern frontier too. So why don't we just get started right now by looking at Mercury. So right here we have some depictions of Mercury and in the center right here we have a very classical depiction of Mercury. To start off with he's got his cockerel right here which is one of the animals he's associated with and then alongside that as well a goat. He carries his staff and has his winged helmet but otherwise is naked except for his cloak. And so that is a very much the classical depiction of Mercury. Now when Mercury starts off he probably starts as the Etruscan deity Turms. T-U-R-M-S. And when he starts off as terms, as a god of commerce and travel and that sort of thing like that. As the Roman um, pantheon grows, and especially after much more of the Greek influence from the 4th century BC onwards, you see him become very, very similar to Hermes, which obviously is the Greek counterpart. And so when they become like that, they become ne nearly indistinguishable. They become pretty much the same deity. And he adopts pretty much all of Hermes mythology and becomes just a Roman version of Hermes with a few hang-ons from the previous deity. So when you've got that, he becomes the god of business, of trade, he becomes the god of messengers, communication, um, also divine or magical communication as well through uh, both divination and things like that. He's the god of transport as well, thieves, and also alongside this as well, funnily enough, etiquette as well. So when you've got all of those things, he's seen as a very important deity. And he becomes quite an important one to the Romans as well, because it's not just martial prowess that expanded the Roman Empire, but also trade and benefit too. And when you've got that trade and benefit, you can see that with two of the depictions we have right here from Hadrian's Wall. So the first one right here would have been possibly in the side of a building or in a public place. So as you walk past it, you could venerate the deity. Right here, we've got a very nice carved image, which would have been in the Vicus or the civilian settlement of a Roman fort. When you've got this, people would walk past it and say little prayers to the god. And when you would say little prayers to the god, you can see all of his normal depictions, as you would see in the uh, classical one just behind me. He's got his cloak right here and his staff. He's naked, just like the other one. And then right here, we've got a little box right beside him as well. In this other depiction right here, we have one from Halstead's Roman fort. And this uh, was stationed with Germanic troops, but you can still see some of the key features between the two of them. This uh, Mercury right here doesn't seem as boyish as the other two. So Mercury is normally depicted almost like an adolescent or a young man. This one here seems slightly older in his depiction. We still have the classical representation of him naked. You can see his staff in his other hand right here. He almost has a little bag, which would probably contain money or something like that. And then you can also see his winged helmet right at the top there. And that's from Halstead's Roman fort. So you can see there's a consensus of how Mercury is depicted as a god of trade, as a god of commerce, and obviously he's a god of travel as well. What we'll do now is we'll look at some of the other depictions of Mercury from Hadrian's Wall as well. So right here we have some of the other depictions of Mercury from Hadrian's Wall, and this is from Chester's Roman fort. So in the centre you can see quite a badly damaged one, but it's also a rougher construction as well. You can see the front of his chest and his head have been removed, but you can just see in his hand his staff and also the naked form of the body. Right next to him we've got another one which has got a question mark next to it. Is this Mercury? 
Now the things that would possibly suggest it is you can just see a staff right here and the naked form of the body. But this is possibly another deity as well, but we're not entirely certain. Now on the other side right here, this is probably my favorite depiction of Mercury from Hadrian's Wall. And I absolutely love the sort of the depiction of this. You can see Mercury right here, and it almost looks like a child's done it. And the reason why I love it is because you know, you can imagine the Romans so often with this beautiful carved classical architecture, classical sculpture, and this, you know, the perfect lines and stuff like that that we expect of the Romans, you know, straight streets, beautiful town planning, all of that sort of stuff. But yet in the Roman world as well, there were also little depictions of gods and altars like this. And that's something that gives me a little bit of hope because you know, not everyone is a master artist, not everyone is a perfect craftsperson, yet right here we have this fantastic depiction of Mercury. You can tell because he's got the sun halos around his head. You can just see over here as well, you've got his staff in his hand, and there's a little box down here as well, which is also associated as his god of trade. You can see that he's naked as well, he's got a belt, and then you can just see his two nipples as well. And what I love about this is that someone is wanting to get favor of Mercury. They're wanting to still worship and pray to him. They can't carve to the same level as the previous panels I showed you before. They can't depict him in his wonderful classical style as he would be depicted normally around the place or that depiction from Rome I showed you before. But what they have done is they've gone, well, maybe they do business, maybe they trade, maybe they need safe travels or they've sent letters and they want his letters to arrive safely. So because of that, they've taken this piece of stone and they've set up their own little altar to Mercury with the skill and the ability they have. And because of that, I see this as a much more human representation. If you think about the different levels of art we have in society, sometimes and this is in all areas, because if you think about graffiti, there's really high-end graffiti artists. Like the famous one is someone like Banksy, who is a really high-end graffiti artist. And then on the other side, you've got, you know, maybe a kid with a spray can who then goes along and does his own little tag on a wall. And it might be, you know, all dribbly and not very good, but that's another form of art. You've got public art commissioned by governments in the form of architecture or statues in public spaces that tell a story. And then you have much more primitive forms of art, which is maybe when someone first starts doing art or imagine, you know, when kids come home and they've got their pictures from nursery or school and they ask them to be put on the fridge. In the same way, that's another form of art as well. And in this one here, the person has commissioned a picture of Mercury or done it themselves still to get the favor of the God. They still pray to it. They probably still make sacrifices to it. And I love the human element of it. But at the same time, it's still the same God. They're still showing the same attributes. They're still trying to call on the same example of divine power that they have and they want to represent through Mercury right here. So what we'll do now is now that we've looked at Mercury, we're going to move on to the next gods and we're going to look at Oceanus and Neptune, the Roman gods of the seas and the oceans. So Neptune, just over here, is a god of the seas and the rivers. Now, they, when you look at the sort of the theology of the Roman Empire, many academics believe that Neptune started off as a freshwater deity. Now, the reason why that is, is because the Romans themselves were further inland. They were in the hill area, and so they probably had a river god. As they expanded, they started to come into other cultures, and as they came into other cultures, then Neptune's area expanded from freshwater rivers and lakes and things like that to become the god of the Mediterranean as well. And so he was combined with the Greek Poseidon, and so because of that, Neptune becomes the god of the Mediterranean, god of seas and also the god of rivers. So that's how you get Neptune in his form there. He's obviously an important deity because he is obviously the brother of Jupiter and Dispater, who is the god of the underworld. And so when you've got that, he is a very important male senior deity within the Roman pantheon. And his responsibility for the Mediterranean would have been incredibly important to the Romans, who were very much a terrestrial, terrestrial culture and focused on the land and moving of people across land and were in many ways afraid or disliked water to a great extent. Which is why we also have this deity here, Oceanus. Now Oceanus definitely comes from the Greek world and he is an adopted god. And so he is 
of the wilder ones. Now, originally, he's actually depicted as like a river that wraps around the entire world, and it's a saltwater river that they were depicted there. And when he's depicted as a river, he's almost seen almost like a genus loci, a spirit of location, more than a god. He's more like an idea in many ways than a deity like we imagine with Neptune just over here. So when you have Oceanus, he is seen as even more dangerous than Neptune. Neptune is changeable and dangerous in his own right, but Oceanus, he's another level. And in many ways, he starts becoming associated with almost like the Atlantic Ocean and those large bodies of salt water that are uncontrollable. They would have also seen him in some ways in the Indian Ocean as well. So when you've got those places, he is a very dangerous god. Now the interesting thing is, is these two were dredged out of the River Tyne here in Newcastle during the Victorian period, as they were deepening the river to put in industrial, um, more industrial works on the River Tyne, and they were building a new bridge called the Swing Bridge in Newcastle which I'll just put an image up on the screen here. It's actually a hydroelectric bridge, and it's a pretty amazing bridge in the city as well. Now, when they was being dredged, they discovered these two altars, and they think that they were on the Roman bridge of Pontus Alius, and they were dedicated by Emperor Hadrian himself and the Sixth Legion. And they were actually have a dedication saying, dedicated by Emperor Hadrian and the Sixth Legion for a safe journey across the sea. So they probably set off from the Netherlands and then arrived over in the northeast of England. And you can just see the six right here, the VI of the six, and then PF, faithfully dedicated. And so you've got the Sixth Legion dedicating to both Neptune and Oceanus for a safe journey across. Now you could just take it at face value and take it just at that level and have an understanding that they are saying thank you to these gods of these wild seas because obviously Neptune, Neptune is the god of the rivers and of the god of the Mediterranean saltwater bodies in his own right but Oceanus is probably connected to the Atlantic, to the North Sea and is seen as the more wild god as you're heading towards northern Britain that you have to please and to try and get him on side because of the dangers of crossing across. But there is another instance going on as well, which is equally as cool. And this is to do with Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great, when he got right the way out to India, made a dedication of two altars to Oce Neptune and Oceanus. And he was saying, I have reached the edge of the world, made a dedication to the two gods. Sorry, I do apologize. He did it obviously to Poseidon and Oceanus. But I just used the Roman names there. So apologies there for that. But he makes this dedication to these two gods and he's saying i've come to the end of the known world i've come to the end of all of that is known and this is the end of it and so hadrian when he's coming over here to northern britain he, he sailed up the river tyne to Pontus Alius, and he's coming to where he's constructing his wall across northern britain is actually copying and people who knew their history would have known that alexander had done the same thing and Hadrian is saying, I have come to the end of the world. Just as Alexander was across in India, I am across here in Britain, and I'm at the end of the known world. And so when he's doing this here, dedicating to both ne Oceanus and Neptune, that's a really important thing where he is saying, right, I'm like Alexander, I'm a conqueror. I've come out to the edge of the world, but at the same time, I'm saying I'm dedicating to these gods because this is the edge, this is unknown, this is new, weird and dangerous. And so by saying to these two gods, who are also in their own way quite dangerous deities for in the Roman mindset because of their association obviously with salt water, with wildness, with uncontrollability, and the, the Roman pantheon originally originating from this hill tribes of you know central Italy, you know, these water deities are quite quite dangerous in many ways or they're outside of the normal and so I love that that Hadrian is not only saying this as a um, you know I'm dedicating to these gods for a safe journey but he's also reflecting something that's previously happened and acknowledging the power of Alexander and also saying well I'm like Alexander because Alexander did this therefore I'm doing it too and so these altars and the choice of gods tells us way more than you would think otherwise. And I love that in its own way, this, this layers of information that you can get out of just something as simple as two little altars dedicated by an emperor into this area up in Northern Britain. 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to move on again and we're going to look at we're going to look at Hercules and his story as well. So right now we're looking at Hercules and I'm going to guess you've heard of Hercules because he's so famous within most civilizations as this great hero obviously made uh, more famous by stuff like TV shows, films, stuff like that and he's a popular topic though often we depict him as we see the male body today and like what we consider you know sort of like attractive within the male physical form when I look at the statues of Hercules I think he's so interesting because just here behind me you've got this depiction of Hercules and his biceps are nearly the same size as his thighs he reminds me of some of the rugby players you see these are massive massive guys huge muscles stuff like that and if he's supposed to be a representation of strength and muscle and huge muscle density and all of that stuff as well Hercules was adopted from the Greek legends so he was in the Greek myths he's seen as more of a hero whereas in the Roman side he's definitely seen as a deity and so they adopted a lot of his mythology from the Greeks when they adopted his mythology they then also added in some of his own as well and he was famous for his own adventures and the challenges he's faced as well in the Disney version he's seen as the son of Jupiter and, and and Juno or Zeus and Hera as their Greek form is but um, obviously in reality he's again an um, offspring of another one of Jupiter sorry Zeus's adulteries and so Hera spends a lot of her time trying to kill the infant with snakes or with the various challenges as well and unfortunately he's struck by madness he kills his own family and then has to go on a sort of repentance which is the great challenges that eventually at the end of it result after his own death of becoming a part of the pantheon and becoming divine and a part of the god uh, the gods in Mount Olympus and so the Romans adopt that and as a part of it he's seen as a uh, part of Roman myth and legend as well and they adopt him and he's seen as a defender of the Aventine Hill against a fire giant so he protects against this fire giant and that is all a part of his mythology as well so you can see in the images I've got here he's depicted with his club which is his primary weapon and so that is depicted right here and also in this one right here as well just at the feet right here, this is from Corbridge in the centre of Hadrian's Wall. It's one of the major towns on Hadrian's Wall as well. And this is Minerva. And Minerva was Hercules' patroness. So she is actually guiding him here. And you can see Hercules right there in his huge classical form. And he's got his club in one arm and he's about to probably smack something in the face with his massive club. He's depicted in the Greek style as well. We can know that he's a Greek because of the full beard. Um, it's very interesting when you often think of some of the Roman emperors, but Emperor Hadrian was the first Roman emperor to have a beard because he was a Grecophile. He really enjoyed the Hellenistic world and so he adopted the beard as well. And then that continued with further emperors again, with later emperors actually going back to clean shaven to be more re reflective of Augustus and the imperial power there. So normally you can see a connection to the Greek world through a sort of a beard like this so that is Hercules's beard is a Greek aspect of the character um, when you're looking at him as well he's also um, seen as quite an interesting character because he was adopted by numerous different cultures Tacticus says that in the stories of the Germans they actually held and they believed that Hercules had visited them and he was in a lot of their stories their sagas and so when he was in their stories we actually see within the uh, the German world closer to Rome Hercules um, club is quite a popular um, amulet and the Hercules club is within the Germanic world and then as you come into the fourth fifth centuries it starts going um, across uh, the river Rhine and into the other parts of the Germanic world as well there are some theories that over time it mutated and Hercules club slowly became Thor's hammer and some of the stories of the legends of Hercules over time mutated into becoming some of the feats that you see associated with um, Thor, the Germanic god. So there's a possibility there that there was some sort of osmosis or like mixing of cultures together that resulted in Hercules becoming Thor or an aspect of Thor at least within the Germanic world. So it's a very interesting one there. 
He was also very popular with some emperors who wanted to depict themselves as a heroic. So for instance, Commodus. Uh, you'll probably know the name Commodus better from Gladiator and uh, his depiction in the film Gladiator. The funny thing is in the film Gladiator, he is quite a, a, a normally proportioned man. Commodus was kind of like, imagine a WWE wrestler or like a rugby player or stuff like that. And he styled himself as Hercules. He liked to go into the arena, into the Colosseum dressed as Hercules and fight against other opponents who unfortunately weren't armed with uh, as good weapons as him. And he would just go in and win the crowd support. And he was a, kind of like a, a, a superstar player. Think of him as sort of like a um, Conor McGregor or a Tyson Fury of his day. More built like Tyson Fury, attitude of Conor McGregor. You kind of get the kind of guy Commodus was. And then that's the, the sort of the, the image you get. So Hercules was also very interesting with emperors. And they really liked him as a sort of a style um, to depict themselves as these heroic, huge, strong very very masculine in a sort of hyper masculine form of the of man and also god as well and that was a mixing that you see there and you can sometimes see that in the images and the way they showed themselves i really hope you've enjoyed this understanding of hercules and how his stories and his mythology from greece then moved into the roman world and how he was depicted in various places so i hope you've enjoyed this little depiction of these four gods mercury Neptune, Oceanus and Hercules and they're having a look at how they're depicted on Hadrian's Wall. All of these gods were very very popular in different ways so obviously Oceanus and Neptune would be important to people traveling across what is now the North Sea between the Roman side of Germany, the Netherlands and northern France into the British Isles and Oceanus as well more so because of the wild nature of the Atlantic and also the North Sea as well. You've got Mercury as well, who is a god of trade, would be very important for supplying the soldiers on the northern frontier of Hadrian's Wall. And so his depictions, both in the classical style and also in the more crude uh, local style, were very important to people sending communications backwards and forwards, developing commerce, developing business and trade up here on the northern frontier. And finally, Hercules, who was seen as a patron to many of the soldiers on Hadrian's Wall. And they really liked his adventures, his camaraderie, his physical strength, and also how relatable he was as a broken character, but also as a redeemed character as well within Roman mythology and Greek mythology as well. So I really hope you've enjoyed looking at these characters, their depictions on the frontier, and that you've also enjoyed my storytelling as well. As always, please do like and subscribe. Put some of your thoughts down in the comments as well. I'd love to chat with you a bit more. If you'd like to support me, I do have a Patreon as well, which you can find a link in the description. And why don't you join us for another video shortly as we'll be looking at more of the gods in the near future. But in the meantime, stay safe and well, and thank you so much for joining me. Until next time though, goodbye.